Uh, hi folks, in this video, we are going to take a quick dive into the evolution gradient algorithm, and this will serve as the foundation when we talk about the natural evolution strategy in the next video. The evolution gradient is a population-based optimization algorithm, and it's in many ways similar to the evolution strategies kind of algorithm that we saw in the CMAES series. And just like evolution strategies, it is mostly based on going back and forth between using a probability distribution to generate some samples and then using those samples to update the probability distribution. However, evolution gradient is different from the evolution strategies in a very crucial way. And that is, as the name suggests, uh, the gradient, because evolution gradient actually defines an objective and it uh, derives an explicit gradient by trying to maximize that objective. So in a way, you can say that evolution gradient is quote-unquote more explicit about updating the distribution than evolution strategies. And in order to better understand the comparison, let us first have a very quick recap on the simple evolution strategies based on Gaussian distribution that we saw in CMAS part 1. So every generation, uh, the simple Gaussian distribution does these three things in a loop. It first generates a number of samples uh, from its Gaussian distribution with m as the mean and sigma as the covariance matrix. And then it evaluates those samples and gets their fitnesses. And it sorts those samples in order of descending uh, fitness. And then it gets a subpopulation of those samples that have relatively high fitness. And those become the so-called elites of this generation. And finally, in this generation, uh, it updates the distribution parameters, in this case, just the mean m, and it updates it to the average across those high fitness elites. Now, I don't think we ever uh, explicitly talked about why this entire procedure uh, works. But if you think about it, the real optimizing part of this procedure is when we update the distribution parameters, right? In this case, the mean m. Because every generation, when we update the mean m, we are updating it to the average across elites, which are likely going to have higher fitnesses than the, old, than the old mean, right? So every generation, we are kind of improving the fitness of the mean, and we are kind of shifting the center of our distribution gradually towards the uh, optimum, such that every next generation, we are more likely to sample higher fitnesses with our um, population, which are in turn going to give us even better updates on the distribution parameters, and et cetera, and et cetera. So in conclusion, evolution strategy works and actually optimizes because every generation we are implicitly improving the Gaussian distribution. In comparison with evolution strategies, which implicitly improves the distribution by ways such as sorting by fitness and biasing towards high fitness elites, uh, the evolution gradient decides to be more explicit with optimizing the distribution parameters. It actually defines an objective, and it treats the entire problem as just an ordinary uh, objective maximization problem. And it, it derives the gradient using this objective. So um, the objective is defined as this expression here. Uh, the theta here represents the distribution parameters, which in the case of Gaussian would just be the mean m and the covariance matrix sigma. And you would essentially just flatten the uh, covariance matrix and then concatenate it at the end of the mean to form a very long vector, and that would be your theta. But as we will see soon, this kind of doesn't matter so much. And then z represents an arbitrary sample uh, generated by the distribution. And then put together, pi z given theta represents the probability of generating sample z given the distribution parameters uh, theta. In other words, it is just the probability density function, or PDF, which, for the, which in the case of Gaussian would just be this expression here. And then we have uh, F of Z, which represents the fitness of the sample of Z. So, put, so, putting everything to, so putting everything together, this entire expression essentially means just the expected total fitness uh, of the entire uh, generation. So here we have the fitness and we scaled it by the likelihood of getting this thickness, and we just sum this expression over the entirety of the population. And that, by definition, is equal to the expectation of fitness z. So now we have the objective that we want to maximize, and we want to maximize it by changing the distribution parameters theta. So we just do what we do normally, which is to take the gradient of this expression over theta. And because uh, f is a function of z, not theta, 
we can just skip over it and move the gradient symbol right in front of the PDF. Which again, if we were to use Gaussian as an example, we will just end up with this scary looking equation here. But fortunately, this is not the equation, this is not the gradient that you want to solve uh, for two reasons. The first reason is that as we just saw, it was, it, it was a pretty complicated calculation. And as we surely all know, it is a pain to take the gradient over like a huge product term because then we'd have to use something such as, you know, quotient or product rule. Though indeed, this is technically solvable, but even then you'd still have a second insurmountable problem, which is this integration symbol. Or rather, it's not quite the integration symbol itself, but the fact that we do not have the exact definition of this fitness function, fz, which is assumed to be black box. So what do I mean by black box? Well, first of all, the opposite of black box is the kind of function that we are familiar with, the kind such as y equals 2x, which is clearly defined, and we know how to take its gradient or its integral. But with a black box function, we do not know its uh, mathematical definition exactly. And that the only kinds of interactions that we can have with it uh, are the inputs and outputs. We can feed it with something, and we can get something back. But we do not know the inner working of the function. And one common reason that we might end up with such a black box function is when we're trying to represent a model that is too complicated to uh, like define mathematically. And a good example of such a black box uh, function is just um, the neural network, right? We know we can feed it with something, we know we can get something back, but the inner working of it is pretty much just black magic to us. So by assuming this F set to be black box, or rather by not assuming this F set to have a mathematical definition, uh, we allow a great deal of flexibility with evolution gradient, and we can use it to solve many complicated problems. But of course, the downside, again, is that we cannot solve this integration analytically. So what do we do then? Are we just stuck? Well, fortunately, from two slides back, we saw this equality between expectation and integration. So if only we could rewrite um, this expression into expectation, then we can kind of transform our problem into an expectation problem, which we can approximate by taking samples. But there is a problem, because the uh, equality that we saw two slides back has this kind of form. And whereas the equation that we want to rewrite into expectation has this kind of form. And notice the difference between the two. Here we have a PDF, but here we have the gradient of a PDF. So in order to rewrite our integration into expectation, we need to kind of have a PDF on the outside and essentially make the entire expression into this kind of form where um, x represents just an arbitrary function and then we have the PDF. And this is where the so-called log likelihood trick comes in. The first step of the log likelihood trick is to multiply our expression by this thing over here, which obviously evaluates to 1 and therefore does not break the equality. And you may immediately notice that we now have this PDF term on the outside. So we have already accomplished what we had wanted to do, which is to um, rewrite the things inside the integral into this form. And in our case, x is just equal to this thing inside the bracket. And furthermore, due to a pretty well-established rule with log derivative, we can just rewrite the things inside the bracket into this. So our entire integral is rewritten into expectation of this form. And we can estimate this expectation by taking samples and evaluating this expression for each sample, and then just averaging over all those evaluations. And notice that this step does not require us to know the explicit mathematical definition of this fitness function f. We will be able to just generate a sample, feed it into the fitness function, and get, the, get back its value for that specific sample. And that, in my opinion, is the most important contribution of the log likelihood trick which is to allow us to estimate this integral uh, without having to analytically solve it. So now finally, we have accomplished what we had set out to do, which is to get the gradient um, of the objective over here. So by calculating this expression every generation and uh, updating the distribution parameters along its direction, we'll be able to uh, improve our distribution. This here is the pseudocodes for the evolution gradient. It's more like a general framework kind of thing, and we do not yet assume a certain kind of distribution. Uh, but anyways, every generation we um, take lambda samples and we evalu evaluate their fitnesses and also their log gradients, which we'll later be able to plug into this expression to calculate 
our gradient for that specific generation. And then we essentially do a gradient descent step on the distribution parameters. And we, oh, sorry. And we do this for, and we do this for every generation until we converge on an optimum. And if we were to use a uh, Gaussian distribution as our distribution, we will just simply need to plug the Gaussian PDF into the pi here. Uh, and we will simply need to update these two parts uh, to reflect how the log gradient of Gaussian PDF is calculated. Um, and this here essentially shows how it's done. And after that, we just get the Gaussian version of the evolution gradient. Uh, I, I do want to point out two things though before we wrap, before we wrap up. Uh, the first is how applying the log gradient uh, instead of just simply gradient simplifies our calculation. Uh, again, the Gauss, here's the Gaussian PDF, which is a huge product term. But log has this convenient property where log xy equals log x plus log y. So by taking the log of this PDF, we can transform um, this huge product term into a sum of three terms. And as we know, taking the gradient over a sum of terms is much easier than taking the gradient of a product of terms. And therefore, the log likelihood trick also kind of solves um, the first problem that we mentioned earlier about uh, the difficulty with taking the gradient. Uh, the second thing I want to address is a potential source of confusion, where here um, we have two lines, uh, whereas before, in a general case, we have just one line. So what's going on here? Well, <laughs> nothing is going on, really. It's just uh, different ways of representing the same thing. You can choose to, as I said earlier, uh, flatten the covariance matrix into a long vector and then concatenate at the end of the uh, mean vector to get the very long vector, which will be your theta. Or you can do the updates uh, on the mean and then on the covariance matrix uh, independently. So you have two like separate updates. And also, by the way, they use uh, mu here uh, instead of m to represent the mean. It's just it is the same as uh, when we use m to represent the mean. It's just a conventional thing. So don't worry about it too much. Maybe you didn't quite follow all the mathematical derivations that we covered so far. Uh, that is fine, even though I would recommend going back to the confusing parts. But even if we were to just drop all the mathematical derivations and just look at the final equation that gives us the gradient, this should still make sense. Because, well, first of all, the log gradient term uh, indicates the direction that we want to update uh, the di distribution parameters theta in order to get the largest increase in the uh, log PDF. In other words, it indicates how do we want to change the distribution in order to make it more likely to sample a specific uh, sample z. And then we are going to scale this direction with the fitness of z. So a certain sample with higher fitness is going to get its direction scaled up more than another sample with lower fitness. So what this equation essentially does is that it makes our distribution more likely to generate high fitness samples and less likely to generate low, low fitness samples. And hopefully with that kind of intuition, uh, you can be more convinced that evolution gradient works. And also, just as a quick side note, if you have experience with reinforcement learning, then you may have noticed that this update is quite similar to the update in the policy gradient. And actually, I'm not going to uh, go into more details, but if, if you were to just replace the fitness with the Q value and the PDF with the policy, then you'd get essentially just the same update equation. And I've actually found it quite fascinating that the evolution and RL communities share many common developments. And we're going to actually uh, mention, talk about one of those uh, shared developments when we talk about the natural evolution strategy in the next video. And here is just a quick demo to show you that evolution gradient works. Um, as you may observe, uh, while the evolution gradient seems to work, its updates seem to be a bit unstable. And this is especially obvious with the covariance matrix update. And as you can see, it kind of swirls around quite a bit before it shrinks and converges on the optimum. And we're going to tackle this problem when we talk about the natural evolution gradient in the next video.